not to be linear. Here's another perspective. This is a view, not a predominant view necessarily, but that's how people in Moscow look at the problem. And Ely is a Russian word for or. So the choice for the Ukrainians is to pick a Nazi fascist Ukraine or pick Russia. So um, is this a satisfactory frame? Not exactly, because when people in the Kremlin talk about Ukraine's nationalism, uh, fascism, they talk about a particular political party group that is in the government, but the government is not dominated by the right-wing group. There are elements of that right-wing group that are being referred to as Nazis, but they are not the dominant group. Second point, it can be quite insulting to some because the Soviet Union lost 30 million lives during the Second World War. Most of them were Russians and Ukrainians. So what is the message that is being sent here? If you use a Nazi symbol, for Russians it's a very powerful message because they lost many lives. So anything that has that Nazi flavor would be totally unacceptable. But so is for the Ukrainians. If you portray Ukrainians as Nazis today, that's also an insult to the Ukrainians. So therefore, it looks like it's a little more complex. And we need to understand the complexity, uh, look at the sources, we'll make some comparisons, and uh, talk about implications. This is what we will try to do. Uh, we know we, we don't have much time, so we'll try to do our job in, uh, I said almost 30 minutes, maybe 35, 40, but definitely time for your q and um, so you see the Crimea here, right? So between Russia and Ukraine. So a little bit on the history. Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the history of uh, Russia and Ukraine relations is also very complex. On one hand, if you ask Russians, they say our history started from Kiev. The first Russian state was called Kiev and Rus, and Kiev is the capital of Ukraine. So uh, the two have been very close. Ukraine asked to be to join Russia's union as a result of fights. So Ukraine was always the apple of discord between powerful neighbors. Russia, Poland uh, fought for uh, Ukraine, and uh, Russia, the eastern part at least, uh, joined uh, uh, Russia. At the same time, there have been some very tragic moments in history. Uh, the starvation of the 30s, many Ukrainians or Ukrainian nationalists see this as a deliberate attempt by uh, Soviet leadership uh, to punish Ukrainians, uh, starve them. A perspective that is not necessarily shared by the Russians because they say, well, Stalin was a Georgian in the first place. And second, many even the Russians themselves suffered during that time. But that's very, very <coughs> tragic history. The other tragedy is during the Second World War. Uh, during the Second World War, as part of the uh, Russian Soviet German treaty, uh, Ribbentrop Pact, uh, Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, Soviet Union occupied what was what is now Western Ukraine. And during the Second World War, some of the West Ukrainians uh, formed their own nationalist groups led by leader Bandera, who uh, attacked the Soviets and uh, joined the Nazis. So when you talk about Western Ukraine today, in many minds of the Russians, it is also elements in Western Ukraine were always anti-Soviet, anti-Russian, and they joined the Nazis. And that's why this message about fascism in West Ukraine is so powerful for the Russians, because they associate with that particular issue. And then uh, Russia and Ukraine um, after, uh, decided to uh, separate in 91 and both became independent. Just to remind you that Russia was one of the 15 republics that was in Ukraine. Some key political factors, if you look at the numbers, mostly Ukrainian, 77%, but that doesn't tell you everything. 
Uh, many of the Ukrainians don't speak Ukrainian, and they speak Russian better than they speak Ukrainian. So uh, when you hear people in Kremlin or Moscow talk about Russian speaking, it could be Ukrainians also who are more comfortable with Russian identity and culture than they are with Russian. Um, and so basically, Ukraine is divided between East, culturally and linguistically, North pro Russian, Russian Orthodox, and the West, which is more Catholic or the Union kind of uh, um, Orthodox Catholicism version, um, and also more Eastern. The other one is Ukraine totally depends on Russian oil and gas supplies for its needs, plus Ukraine serves as a transit point for Russian oil and gas to Europe. So there is a major energy factor. Uh, political crisis, two slides, <coughs> but even that doesn't cover everything. But basically, political crisis, we start showing here from November 2013, actually it started much earlier. Ukraine has been in turmoil for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, in 2004, protests, the so-called power revolution in Ukraine, led to the overthrow of the government a new democratic government came to power, didn't last long, unfortunately, fell into, into the same trap of corruption, mismanagement. And uh, so Russia, Ukraine's uh, history uh, of governance has been very, very sad and tragic. But from November 2003, we see this escalation. And what led to the escalation was to sign an agreement with EU on partnership or not to sign. When Ukraine decided to sign, very much for economic reasons, uh, Ukraine is almost a bankrupt country. They need desperately $15 billion of money to just save it. But Russia warned that if Russia joins, uh, if Ukraine joins the EU partnership, then Russia will stop subsidizing oil and energy supplies. So Ukrainian government decided to reconcile the two perspectives and ask the EU for trilateral discussion. The EU declined trilateral discussions with Russia because they said Russia has no say in our partnership with uh, Ukraine. So that led to more uh, uh, kind of, uh, led to protests in the streets as you told me so. Uh, people were killed. Yanukovych president had to flee. He was removed. Uh, and then we see um, some uh, new developments including something that I'd like to uh, emphasize again, some right-wing party members joined the Ukrainian government. Russian language was um, um, used to be a, a second language in Eastern Ukraine for regions, several regions. That was abolished by the government in Ukraine. And that was used as a trigger to start pro-Russian militant activities in uh, Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and the justification was, well, we have an illegitimate government there, and we have a, a government that uh, is going to suppress the Russians because they are removing the Russian language as an option. Um, that led to a referendum, a very controversial topic because from the Russian perspective, the referendum was legitimate. 97% said, yes, we want to join Russia. Uh, from the perspective of uh, Tatars in Crimea or Western opinions, there was a uh, have a military presence of Russia uh, and during the referendum, so that was not objective, but I'll talk about that later. Um, so we see then the, the, uh, the um, protest spreading to eastern Ukraine, and finally April 17, Geneva agreement between uh, Russia, Ukraine, EU, and the United States. Uh, as a former diplomat, frankly, I was uh, very pleased to to know that this agreement would reach almost in one day, but also very worried because for such a complex problem to go away with a solution was a little bit um, um, kind of unexpected. And what happens now is that the Geneva Agreement is not working because it looks like we can't, the two sides don't agree on what the agreement was about. Because the West says the agreement is about uh, um, uh, um, the, the pro-Russian militants who have occupied buildings in Eastern Ukraine vacating these buildings. The Russian position is, no, the agreement is talking about all militants, so people in Kiev streets who are also occupying buildings and barricades should also uh, 
decades. And so until that is done, we cannot draw uh, our fish. So Boriana uh, and I uh, are also learning causal loops. So this is a very simplistic causal loop, and we invite you to come up with your own. But here, based on what we talked about, is uh, see the, what, if Ukrainian governance goes down, the dependence on economic assistance goes up. And when it goes up, what we see in particular case is increased rivalry uh, for influence on Ukraine. So, so whether the problem is the governance or the problem is interference in Ukraine, but there is definitely no connection here. And Harry, each party claims that uh, they are right. Um, Briefly on Crimea, which is, talking about the Ukraine crisis, I think there are two pieces. Crimea, which seems like we have already abandoned Crimea because we are all focused on Eastern Ukraine, East Ukraine. But Crimea uh, used to be an independent Canaanite or Canaanite that was influenced by the Ottoman Turkey very much. It was uh, taken over by Russia. Uh, but during the Soviet period, uh, Prime Minister Khrushchev in 1954, under unclear circumstances, and some say he wanted to be generous to Ukraine, but others say he wasn't very sober. Uh, but he decided that uh, Crimea should be part of Ukraine rather than Russia. And uh, after all, who cares? It was part of the Soviet Union. Who could have thought in 1954 that there would be no USSR uh, in 1991? So that really didn't make much uh, difference at the time. But of course, um, in 1991, when the uh, USSR um, uh, dissolved, there was a danger that the Soviet Union would become another Yugoslavia. And making a connection to you, you know what happened to Yugoslavia was that, well, if you want to become independent, we want a piece of the land for people that are our people to stay with us. Um, whether it's China or whether it's uh, Bosnia. Fortunately, that didn't happen uh, during the breakup of USSR. I think Yeltsin and the other leaders managed to agree that there will be no territorial issues. You take whatever you have, that's it, no Crimea issue. There was some tension in 1992, but that was resolved. And Crimea voted with Ukraine for independence and uh, agreed to a constitution. Um, uh, of 1992 that makes Ukraine autonomous republic, uh, made Crimea autonomous republic of Ukraine. And then a, a, a separate agreement was signed to allow the Russians to have a military base in the Sevastopol port, and that was uh, extended to 2042 in exchange for oil and gas supplies. Remember I said the energy factor? So it, it, um, Ukraine desperately needs oil and gas, so that was very much a deal uh, weapons for uh, oil and gas. Uh, Crimea, this is the population of Crimea, as you can see. Large Ukrainian population, you would say 25%, but primarily Russian and Tatars, who are, are um, most of them not very happy about uh, uh, changing the status, but uh, most of them even didn't participate in the election. So what's the uh, US and EU reaction to what happened in Ukraine? The West uh, accuses Russia of uh, violating territorial integrity. This is unconstitutional. <coughs> Referendum wasn't allowed by Ukrainian constitution. It uh, breaches international law and most importantly violates 1994 agreement in Budapest between uh, Ukraine, Russia, U uh, US and UK guaranteeing Ukraine territorial integrity and sovereignty in exchange for Ukraine surrendering nuclear weapons. So Ukraine today accuses Russia of violating the agreement, but Ukraine is also unhappy with the United States and UK for not doing enough to guarantee that agreement. And that's a very uh, tense issue. On Eastern Ukraine, the Western position is that behind the pro-Russian militants, there is a Russian um, interference, and you know in the sanction list that was announced yesterday, uh, some of the people on the Russian list were um, director of the uh, military intelligence uh, that is being accused of uh, being behind these events. Uh, and that uh, Putin is trying to recreate 
the former Soviet Union. So when we talk about Putin wanting to recreate the former Soviet Union, usually the arguments are, there are three or four arguments. One is, this is what happened to Georgia, this is what happened to Moldova, this is what is likely to happen to the Russian, uh, the Baltic states, because they have large Russian population, and this is what will happen to Kazakhstan, because it has a large population, and northern part of Kazakhstan, according to the Russians, were given to Kazakhstan as a generous gift during the formation of the Soviet Union. So I'm not going to go into detail, but you have specific questions on which we can discuss, but yeah, there is some similarity, but they're also very different cases. Georgia has no, uh, Abkhazia and Ossetia have not been annexed by Russia, and they have, they have asked to be annexed and become part of Russia, but Russia has refused it. Transnistria, which was used to be part of Moldova, heavily Russian populated, has asked to be part of Russia. Russia has refused so far. Um, so, Novorossiya is the new concept that says Russia and Eastern Ukraine were culturally, historically together, so there is concern that Russia is wanting to spread, at least if not to recreate the entire Soviet Union, but, but the Russian kind of uh, uh, nationhood and state. Um, but um, Baltics in the states, uh, well, uh, Baltic states are members of NATO. So, there is, I think, very little possibility of uh, any trouble between Russia and Baltic states who are uh, members of NATO, and there is little, I think, possibility of Russia and Kazakhstan going into any uh, F F conflict, because Kazakhstan is a very loyal ally of Russia, and uh, as you know, um, Ukraine issue was triggered by pro-Western tendencies of Ukraine, which we are not seeing in Kazakhstan. So these examples have, have some value, but they are not exactly helpful. Um, US and EU have come up with certain sanctions against uh, Russia, as you know. Um, they are primarily uh, uh, focusing on individuals, not companies. Um, and um, some recent ones uh, targeting uh, the energy and uh, arms weapons, which are the two major um, export uh, um, items for Russia. Um, also, reassurance have been given to NATO members of East Europe and uh, trying to diversify Ukraine's energy uh, situation. But that is not easy. As you know, there's talk about uh, the shale gas and opportunities from that. And that takes years. And, uh, uh, even Europe cannot reduce its dependence on um, uh, Russian oil and gas for many years. Russia's justification, well, that Khrushchev was wrong, it was a historic mistake. This is a right for self-determination, people voted, 97%. Look what happened in Kosovo. Kosovo became independent. Um, and that's when I will invite Oriana in Eastern Ukraine, again reference to the legal nature of uh, government, uh, fascism, and ethnic rights of Russian and Russian speakers are being uh, targeted. And the West generally, is, this is another step in the West trying to undermine uh, Russia. Uh, and um, that's part of that story where certain activities by the United States and European countries have been seen as anti-Russian uh, NATO expansion, missile defense programs, and so this has been seen as, a, as part of the package. You are taking over our sphere of influence, you are trying to take Ukraine away from us, so it's not just about Ukrainian people. So here I would like to invite Boryana to uh, help us understand is Crimea really a Kosovo um, or, or not? Kosovo. Kosovo. And don't worry, they are friendly people. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the major arguments that Russian President Vladimir Putin is using in order to justify Crimea joining to Russia. Here's what he says about Kosovo. But let me comment a little bit on Kosovo and then we can look at the similarities and differences between Kosovo and Crimea. Kosovo was an autonomic province of former communist country Yugoslavia 
It was located in the south part of Serbia. For centuries, Kosovo has been an important part of uh, Serbian history and culture, starting with the famous Kosovo battle in 1389, when Serbian Tsar Lazar with his forces went down to Kosovo in order to stand up against incoming invasion of Ottoman Turks. He got defeated, but his fame lives until today. From this day of the battle on Kosovo, Serbian people believe that the place to defend Serbia is in Kosovo. This was on June 28th, and through centuries, every day this date is celebrated in Serbian history as the most important part of Serbian history, most important date. Here we have a home of the majority and the most important Serbian Orthodox churches and monasteries, and Kosovo remains until today a major part of the Serbian cultural identity. With the fall of communism in 1991, we have the rise of nationalism, and the republic started to break in apart from the Yugoslavia. At that time in Kosovo, we have a majority of Albanians population that started creating the Kosovo Liberation Army, supported with the uh, Republic of Albania. Throughout the years, until 1995, 1996, when Albanians started the proclamation of independent Republic of Kosovo, Serbia opposed to that, uh, opposed to that uh, decision and the starting clashes between Albanian and Serbian forces in Kosovo. This was going on until 1998 when Western War got involved in Kosovo situation. After one year of unsuccessful negotiation between NATO forces and Serbian government, US and NATO launched an air attack on sovereign country Serbia on March 24, 1999. It was an enormously destructive air war that lasted 17 days. Until today, we, Serbia considers Kosovo under its sovereignty, even though in February 2008, uh, at that time, President Asim Rugova proclaimed independent Kosovo. Kosovo is recognized by 109 out of 193 UN member countries, and here we have a list of Asia-Pacific countries which did not recognize Kosovo. So what is the similarity and difference between Kosovo and Crimea? First of all, history and culture. So we have a long history and cultural connection between Crimea and Russia, the same in Kosovo and Serbia. In both cases, there was not approval by the international community. UN Security Council did not approve US NATO attacks on Serbia in 99 and did not approve the referendum in Crimea. And the third similarity is this tension between two major principles, territorial integrity and right for self-determination. But there's a difference between how Russia and West see and argue these different principles in two different situations. So in the situation of Crimea, Russia argues that there's a right for self-determination of Russian people in Crimea, while Western world argues for the Ukrainian territorial integrity. And in the case of Kosovo, Russia argued for territorial integrity of Serbia, while Western world argued for rights for self-determination of Albanian people in Kosovo. There, unlike in Kosovo, we have ethnic clashes and conflicts that are going on between Albanian forces and Serbian forces prior to NATO military action to Kosovo. There was no major military actions or killing in Crimea prior to referendum. While Kosovo preferred to stay separate and stay independent, Away from the Greater Albania, we have Crimea joining to the Russia. And last but not least, in the case of uh, Kosovo, we have two major ethnic groups in question, Albanian and Serbian, and in the case of Crimea, we have a uh, third ethnic group. Besides Russian and Ukrainians, we have Tatars. So what did UN do in the case of Crimea? So it passed resolution, actually issued resolution as 2014-189, on March 15, which was supported by 13 out of 15 members. Three of those from Asian Pacific countries, non-permanent member, were Australia, Republic of Korea, and Chile. This resolution noted that Ukraine has not authorized the referendum on status in Crimea and declared that the referendum has no validity. 
It was not adopted because Russia vetoed it as a permanent member and China abstained. So then we have after that, we have referendum in Crimea and another resolution by UN General Assembly on March 24, which affirmed commitment to sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Ukraine and underscored the referendum in Crimea as having no validity. Russia and North Korea from Asian Pacific countries voted against the resolution with nine other countries. Two of those were uh, two out of six Russian uh, crisis allies, uh, security allies, and uh, Armenia and Belarus. We have 100 countries that voted for resolution and 58 countries of state. So here is the list of Asia Pacific countries and their votes. So what does it mean to Asia Pacific countries and what are the future implications for Asia Pacific region and international security and peace in general? Dr. Rogan will continue. Thank you very much. Okay, so you can look at your country vote and uh, maybe in, in our interaction help us understand why your country voted one way or the other. Uh, but this is uh, my perception of uh, the reaction from Asia Pacific countries. I think uh, uh, overall uh, a number of countries in Asia Pacific were uh, quite uh, uh, clear about where they stand. But uh, a large number of Asia Pacific countries didn't want to take any uh, sides uh, in this. What they saw as a Russia-US or Russia-EU uh, dispute. Um, uh, Australia and New Zealand joined sanctions, but others uh, very much look through the, at the problem through their own domestic prism, which is often the case. So just to give you some examples, um, just care if disagrees with me, when Canada decides how to vote, it's not just about principles and norms, and it's not just about being a member of uh, G7 now, uh, but it's also about uh, a large Ukrainian uh, population in Canada. So, in fact, one of the things Canada did is withdrew an ambassador from uh, Moscow uh, for consultations because there is a large Ukrainian population in Canada and uh, that's something you take into account. Um, Japan has a certain dilemma with what to do. Again, as a member of G7, Japan introduced sanctions, but it's a time when uh, Abe is trying to uh, uh, normalize, uh, fully normalize relations with Russia, develop energy cooperation, uh, and so that's not a very good time uh, to antagonize Russia for Abe, but uh, um, that's where we are. Uh, similarly, I think China and India were also having some challenges between, because China has, uh, doesn't want to approve any secessionism uh, elsewhere, because uh, China has its own issues, but at the same time, uh, China is a, is a long time strategic partner. But also, when I talk about suspicion, this is seen as something that is uh, uh, aggressive on the Russian part, but also uh, they see some um, uh, uh, concerning, uh, alarming issues with what they see as a Western interference in uh, affairs uh, of Ukraine and therefore possibly in other countries. So that's another motivation why uh, some countries uh, are uh, uh, trying to find uh, the balance. Uh, what are the implications for uh, Asia-Pacific security? Well, I think there are many options as, as we discussed and maybe that's when we all collectively identify more. Uh, but uh, oftentimes uh, China-Taiwan situation comes up and some believe that China will see this as a, an opportunity uh, for unification uh, the Chinese way. Uh, my personal take on that is uh, uh, we have to be really clear about context every time. Uh, Taiwan is not Crimea, and uh, Taiwan is not Georgia. Uh, there are different uh, political um, uh, um, processes, there are different uh, relationships. Uh, but anyway, questions are being asked. There are separatist movements in other countries of Asia Pacific, and that is, uh, is the Ukraine situation emboldening some separatist movements that feel like if they have the right protection, they can be successful in what they have been fighting for a long time, including ethnic minorities. Um, territorial issues uh, in South China Sea, East China Sea, can be also revisited in terms of what is a sovereignty and what is a historic right. And you know, there's one of the arguments is, is it about law or is it about history? Uh, in Crimea, we have a similar thing. There is a law issue, there is a history perception issue as well. Um, but one of the major 
questions is, uh, is the United States really committed to rebalancing? Uh, there's a lot of debate and talk about that. The Czech foreign minister, for example, blamed U.S. rebalancing to Asia-Pacific as one of the reasons the Ukrainian crisis unfolded. He said, you didn't pay, you are not paying enough attention to Europe anymore, and that's what happened. If you don't pay attention to Europe, <coughs> Russia kind of pops up and uh, starts doing what they want to do. Uh, countries in Asia Pacific are uh, expressing concern. Is the United States going to be committed to its alliance relationship? Well, you kind of didn't really support fully Ukraine. Ukraine is asking for military uh, help or, or supplies. Uh, the, you know, the U.S. position is uh, military supplies are not going to help Ukraine. Uh, diplomacy is the way to go, uh, but we are still committed to our allies. Um, the, the, uh, President Obama's visit to the four countries of Asia Pacific, I think, can be also seen from that context, where there was reassurance to the allies that the uh, U.S. continues to be committed. But if you follow his visit to the, uh, the press conferences, every press conference, he had the same question, are you committed? Are you going to support? Um, what is the impact of Ukraine? I think there are some implications for North Korea's nuclear ambition and appetite because uh, if countries look at the Budapest Treaty of Agreement of 1994 which guaranteed territorial integrity and sovereignty and then the countries who guarantee are not doing anything or not doing enough to, uh, uh, to follow that, w what kind of message does it send to North Korea in terms of security assurances to North Korea? We had the discussion in one of our seminars and they may be actually getting uh, even more encouragement uh, to continue with the nuclear program um, given the context. And finally, Russia's role and presence in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, definitely, Russia is looking more and more to Asia-Pacific as a counterbalance to losing its uh, uh, influence and relationship in Europe. Um, it's all about energy issues, which is not easy uh, because infrastructure is primarily focused on Europe. Um, uh, I just looked at Mohammed and remember he sent me a very good article about uh, the oil and gas issues that uh, possibly drive uh, Russia's interest to Crimea. Uh, my take on that is, uh, yeah, there could be offshore um, energy and gas in Crimea, but Russia's problem is not lack of resources. Russia's problem is lack of technology. And so, by um, if relations with the West uh, deteriorate and sanctions are imposed, Russia's uh, energy sector is going to suffer more from not getting investments and technology rather than expanding. So that's uh, another way of looking at it. But um, what does it mean for Asia-Pacific countries? I think there is a mixed feelings in Asia-Pacific about uh, Russia's uh, growing role in the region. Is it going to be positive, positive, economic, or are we going to see certain tendencies of uh, assertiveness, if not of aggressiveness by Russia in the region? And finally, uh, here are something for us, if we are students of international relations, to look at the implications for anti-international security, uh, conceptually speaking, or practically speaking. Are we back to the zero sum? Uh, there's an article by Kaplan and many others on, hey, uh, we never left the zero sum world. It's, it's always about geopolitics, so let, let's be... Uh, let's be uh, uh, honest. Uh, are some countries destined to be buffer states? Like, you cannot have your own um, agendas, you have to serve as a buffer between the two more powerful. Uh, there have been suggestions that, um, even coming from people like Henry Kissinger, that's the way to go is to make Ukraine another Finland, or uh, make it a neutral country. It's not part of the EU, or it's not part of Russian influence. Well, that sounds technically may be possible, but what kind of message are we sending? Like, so Ukrainians have no role to decide where they want to be, they have to be always neutral between the two, so what kind of questions do we have? Uh, and also, responsibility to protect, given the circumstances. Who can we protect? Are we protecting uh, uh, people who uh, are victims, according to R2P, of genocide and war crimes? Or are we protecting all ethnic people who have some issues, or are we protecting all linguistic uh, people, like every Russian speaker, or English speaker, or Spanish speaker, in the case of Colombia, needs to be protected? Uh, what, 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 how do we understand that? Revolution and outside support. 
Uh, most revolutions in the world have happened with some external support. But how much of external support is acceptable? Uh, one case I can bring you as a case study is um, um, uh, and that's what Russian uh, media used very much to justify the action, was to see uh, some U.S. congressmen and uh, senior State Department officials in Kiev streets supporting the protesters. So according to the Russian perspective, that's too much. Uh, you, you cannot uh, interfere like that directly. Um, but um, th 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 there could be another perspective, which is uh, uh, um, if uh, the government is corrupt, if, if, if it's using force against your own people, uh, someone needs to uh, come to their help. Uh, role of sanctions, uh, are they helpful or not? Um, well, some say these sanctions have very little impact on Russia. Some say even that, well, you know what, that could be to the benefit of Russia, that finally Russia will start developing other sectors rather than oil and gas uh, because of the situation. But uh, uh, others question that. And so one argument is that uh, Russia will, at some stage, due to the impact of the sanctions, and there is an impact of the sanctions, ruble has gone down, uh, uh, capital is fleeing from Russia, so at some stage Russia will have to decide whether Russia wants to continue to fight for influence in Ukraine, or um, it's too, too expensive economically. Um, and finally, because Mary is here, uh, I wanted to end with the media and propaganda part. I mean, how much of what we are seeing, we are hearing is real objective media coverage, and how much of that is uh, propaganda. Uh, when I watch Russian uh, news, uh, or I watch it with my wife, who is also here to support me, just in case. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a friendly crowd. But, uh, um, we, we, very hard, we find it very one-dimensional, uh, very one-dimensional. Well, most of the TV channels in Russia are controlled by the government. But even when they are not controlled by the government, watching some US channels, even PBS, which I like and I watch every day, I don't find it all this to be balanced in terms of there are more speakers speaking, presenting the, the EU and US perspective, and maybe not enough presenting other. Maybe it's a language issue, uh, but um, <coughs> that is uh, something that is also contributing to all this misunderstanding. So I would end with Voriana, who said, um, well, you know, when you look at the differences of perspectives, it's really scary. It's scary how polarized the two perspectives are. And uh, that reminds me of uh, one saying uh, by a famous uh, a wise man in Central Asia, Khojan Nasruddin, as uh, some of you are from that part of the world, maybe know the name of Khojan Nasruddin, <coughs> who was an arbiter in many uh, disputes. So he's uh, walking the street, and there are two men or women arguing, and uh, they say, Khojan, we need your help, man. No. Uh, can, can you uh, help us here? So I said, what's, uh, what's your argument? Well, he listens to the person and says, well, you, you have got a point. And the other person says, but this is what my perspective. Oh, well, you have got a point too. And then there's a passerby who says, hey, Hoja, how is it possible? Two people are arguing and you say each of them has a point. You know what? You have a point too. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are, uh, and um, we have some time for Q&A, uh, but here is a list of readings that we recommend, and most of them are on Asia-Pacific uh, issues, and we have our own researchers. John is writing uh, on the Ukraine crisis here. Um, so uh, this is all we have. Uh, uh, of course, we didn't uh, complete in 30 minutes, but we still have to